All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another of our uh, bi-weekly AMS SM Sports Ultrasound Case Series. Um, I'm Brennan Betrell. I'm taking over for Dr. Cruz this week. Uh, he's away. Um, today we have uh, Dr. Olafade. Uh, he's an assistant professor in orthopedics at Emory School of Medicine. He's board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, sports medicine, and interventional spine. He practices sports medicine with a special interest in ultrasound, youth sports, the active adult, regenerative medicine, and orthobiologics. He is currently a physician for several athletic teams and organizations, including USA Soccer Physician Network, Atlanta Hawks, Emory University, Northview High School, and Mount Pisgah Christian School. I'm not sure if I said that right, Alfie. Um, he's actively involved in the AMSSM uh, local and national media. Uh, Dr. Olafade is going to be presenting on proximal biceps tendinosis and instability today. So I will uh, turn it over to him and let him get started here. Thank you, Brandon. Let me share my screen. Yeah. Looks great. Right. Thank you. So uh, good morning, all. My name is Alfie Olafade. Um, like uh, Brandon mentioned, I would like to thank the AMSSM, uh, Dr. Ryan Cruz, as well as Brandon for um, kind of giving me opportunity to talk uh, today. The topic I'll be discussing today is more proximal biceps tendinosis and instability. So my goal is to kind of uh, talk a little bit about an overview about lung biceps instability, discuss a little bit of tendinopathy tendinosis. We have a short case presentation, uh, discuss a little bit the anatomy involved, uh, talk about the scanning protocols that I usually do, uh, discuss the pathologies, uh, literature review, and talk about a quick report. Um, in terms of lung aid of the biceps uh, instability, this is one quick video that I was able to kind of get online because I don't have a personal one that's really as good as this one. So that's kind of the idea of what we'll see on the ultrasound. So quick anatomy, the biceps tendon usually originates from the supraglenoid tuber tubercle uh, or the labrum on the proximal aspect. Um, in total, it's about six to seven centimeters long and eventually kind of uh, connects to the musculotendinous junction. Uh, one of the, I remember being in medical school and residency, I've always been thought that the transverse humeral ligament is actually what allows the biceps tendon to be stable around the bicipital groove. But the more literature has been shown actually suggests it's the soft pulley system, which is it comprises of the uh, superior glenohumeral ligaments, the coracohumeral ligaments, subscapularis, as well as supraspinatus tendon is actually what anchors the biceps tendon around the groove and allows it to stay stable. Um, usually the biceps, long end of the biceps is not um, a strong uh, uh, stabilizer of the shoulder. Uh, you, its main goal is to kind of help mostly with supination and a little bit of elbow flexion. So when we talk about long head of the biceps pathologies you could have, usually we categorize them into three different groups. One is the instability, which I'll be highlighting a little bit today. From that standpoint, you think about the ligaments, coracohumeral ligaments, you think about the superior glenohumeral ligaments, the subscapularis, as well as the supraspinatus tendon. The second group is the inflammatory group, where usually you have a primary inflammatory process or secondary inflammatory process. The primary one usually are found in more youth athletes, just because of an overuse type uh, injuries, uh, they will have that anterior shoulder pain. The definitive um, pathophysiology of that is sometimes being debated on, but that's a little bit different from the secondary inflammatory ones, which usually you have a sequelae or, or other type of uh, shoulder pathologies that are really affected. It could be glamnohumeral arthritis, it could be rotator cuff um, uh, injuries, as well as impingement that you could have for the secondary one. And lastly, but not the least, you have the traumatic one. The traumatic one is the ones you could have a slight pathology, you could have a partial tear, you could have um, a, a complete tear of the lung head of the biceps. One key thing to keep in mind is usually when it's traumatic, or even with the instability ones, a lot of times they actually associate it with rotator cuff pathologies. And I'm going to stress that 
and highlight that on several slides today. So in terms of the long end of the biceps, like I said, every time you see an injury or pathology with that, the idea to kind of have in mind is usually it doesn't happen by itself. The particular study that was done by Barbara et al. actually showed that a lot of time when you have that, 90% of the time there's associated rotator cuff pathology that you have with it. There was another study that was done by Walsh et al. where you had 446 shoulders with rotator cuff injuries. Out of those, 71 had shoulder instability or long end of the biceps instability. Out of the ones that had the dislocation, the vast majority of them, about 95 to 96% of them, actually had tears of the subscapularis. The point I'm making is when you have long end of the biceps pathology, a lot of times it's associated with other rotator cuff injuries. Specifically out of the rotator cuff injuries, the subscapularis is the one that's usually more affected. And I'll highlight some of those reasons very soon. So in terms of the pathophysiology, how it really happens, I mentioned the instability cascade. So what happens is if the soft pulley that you have, usually which is around the lesser subrosity, if those are compromised, what will happen is the tendon will start to go a little bit more medially off the lesser uh, subrosity. Usually this type of patients will report things like popping or locking sensation as a result of that uh, motion. The second pathophysiology is the one that I mentioned in the primary inflammatory processes, which is more when you have a throwing athlete, usually they have this, you know, internal, uh, uh, internal um, GERD uh, situation. As a result of the GERD situation, you have the change in biomechanics of the shoulder. And as a result of that, it results into some posterior capsule tightness. When you have this posterior capsule tightness, it starts affecting everything on the anterior aspect of the shoulder. Lastly, but not the least, is the subcoracoid impingements that you have over here. Let me play this. I mean, this is just a dynamic study showing, you know, looking at the subscapularis tendon, the coracoid is on the uh, right of the screen. And a lot of times, if you have an impingement of that subscapularis, usually that will result into subscapular issue, which will result into maybe atrophy or injury to the uh, soft pulley that I mentioned earlier. So now moving on to the case is a 57 year old male. Um, this gentleman I've actually treated for other injuries in the past, uh, presented to me with a seven month history of left anterior shoulder pain. Um, I've treated him with PRP injections to his contralateral shoulder, as well as uh, his CMC thumb prior to this. Um, from his previous visit, he was like, doc, by the way, I have this also. So as a result of that, he just wanted some home exercise program because of his busy schedule, he didn't feel like he wanted to go through with physical therapy. So even though that was the presentation of my patients, like I mentioned, a lot of people will have anterior shoulder pain. They will have popping or locking sensation. They could have pain with overhead activities. They could have pain with slipping on that shoulder. For this gentleman in particular, the um, speech test was positive and Jurgensen's test uh, was negative while proximal palpation around the bicipital groove was positive. So from a differential diagnosis, there's several things that it could be. Obviously when people say they have pain with range of motion of the shoulder or AB duction or slipping on the shoulder, that could range from an impingement problem to a rotator cuff pathology to a cervical radiculopathy problem. So there are a variety of different things that we wanna keep in mind. The next focus is after taking a thorough examination, um, or history, go into an examination and see what other imaging studies and modalities is needed to kind of ensure that we have the right diagnosis. The two main uh, tests that I usually do, actually three is just palpation of that bicipital groove. Usually the next one that I do is Jurgensen's test where I have the patient flex the elbow to about 90 degrees and resisted supination of the examiner. The studies that were done shows 32% sensitivity and for a specificity standpoint of 78. Speed test is another one that I do where you have the uh, palm um, in supination, you flex the shoulder about 90 degrees 
and you kind of resist that motion. And the sensitivity and specificity of that are listed below 63% and 58%. So after going through the history, we've done a little bit of physical examination, we've ruled out a few other issues. You wanna get x-rays. And when we look at the x-ray of the patient that I saw, some mild degenerative changes, very mild of the acromioclavicular joint. Other than that, um, this view was relatively normal. This is a grassy view, and as a, for the most part, it's just more of an AP view of the shoulder. One of the things you want to look for in the x-ray is check for glenohumeral arthrosis. Also, check for that gap, that space between the acromion and the humeral head. Usually, you expect um, the distance of about you know, 7 to 13 millimeters or so, but if you have narrowing of that, then you could be concerned about other type of etiologies or pathologies that could be going on including impingement, as well as arthritic changes of the shoulder. So this is just to compare and contrast the sensitivity and specificity of the physical examination we just mentioned to what you have when we do ultrasound. This particular study took all type of biceps tendon pathologies, and it was found the sensitivity and specificity to be 87, 85% as well as 98%. So that's obviously a lot better than the history and the physical examination. So we'll delve in a little bit more into some of the pathophysiology and talk about ultrasound now. Even when you compare the likelihood ratio, Jurgensen's is not as good from a positive and negative likelihood ratio. When you compare it to ultrasound for biceps dislocation and ruptures, they're very, very, very good for that. So even though ultrasounds are good, there are some limitations with ultrasound, but I just point this out to say there are actually limitations on MRI as well. This particular study was done, and what they did in this study is they add a MRI of the shoulders, and after that, they did the diagnosis and they had an arthroscopic surgery by a surgeon. What this study shows is a lot of the subscapularis tendon injuries that patients had preoperatively was actually not seen on the MRI. So when we look at this specific image, you see some of these changes over here around the subscapularis, and you see a little bit of this medial subluxation of the biceps, proximal biceps, as it kind of slides off the bicipital groove. So my point so far is physical examinations are good, but not great. Ultrasound examination usually a lot better. In some scenarios, some people will recommend getting MRIs, but we have to be very careful, understand that MRIs are not that perfect either. So a detailed um, evaluation of the shoulder, identifying the subscapularis is very important in diagnosing of a lung end of the biceps instability. So we'll kind of get to the scanning protocol. Even though we know this problem is more of a long head of the biceps, it's very imp important to make sure you scan the old shoulder to make sure you're not missing anything. For my anterior shoulder protocol, usually I'll scan the biceps tendon, the subscapularis, the coracoid process, as well as the AC joint, and we'll go to other structures after that. So for my um, beginning of my shoulder examination, scanning from the biceps tendon, Usually I'll start around the rotator cuff interval, identifying the biceps tendon. Usually I have my patient in a seated position with the elbow flexed about 90 degrees with a little bit of external rotation to be able to identify the biceps tendon sheet. After that, you'll be able to kind of see the biceps tendon sheet as it presents over here. From a proximal standpoint, we have to be careful that we don't have an isotropy in the way. So a little bit of a cephalot tilt to kind of identify the intraarticular origin is very important. And as I see that, I will kind of go a little bit more distally, just making sure you get the biceps tendon seated in the groove. After that, I go a lot inferiorly. And like I said, continue to check for anisotropy, making sure we have the um, biceps tendon in place. As you go a lot inferiorly, you will get to a point where you can see the pectoralis major tendon and you wanna identify that as well as you go all the way down to the 
muscular tenderness junction. After I do the uh, transverse view, I'll go 90 degrees to see the longitudinal view. And usually with that, you scan all the way down, checking for things like effusion, synovial hypertrophy. And you also make sure you put the collar Doppler on to check for tenosynovitis. This is just a picture of the rotator cuff interval. And one of the things that I want to point out with this is you have the subscapularis over here. You have the supraspinatus over here and the biceps tendon over here. The two structures that I mentioned earlier, the coracoumeral ligaments, is kind of labeled with this arrow over here. And you have the superior uh, glenohumeral ligament that is here. If you have a compromised of this structure here, of the bottom one, or medial one, as well as subscapularis, that's more likely to result into instability of the shoulder. So moving forward, we want to kind of see the subscapularis a little bit better. Doing that, I'll go external rotation will be elbow flex 90 degrees in order to see the full subscapularis tendon. It's very important to make sure we see the coracoid process medially to check for effusion and make sure there's nothing else that's present there. The long axis view will show a very good view of the subscapularis. After you do that, you kind of rotate about 90 degrees to see the short axis view. It's very important not to confuse the findings on the short axis view for pathology. Usually this is more multifascicles that you have with alternating hyperchoic and hyperchoic structures. That's usually the normal anatomy of the subscapularis tendon in the short, view, short axis view. While I'm here as well too, I'll do a little bit of dynamic motion where we're doing external and internal rotation just to make sure you don't have any abutment or impingement of the subscapularis tendon right under this coracoid process that is present there. After that, I'll move on to the AC joint uh, just to kind of check um, this. And after that, I'll go to the coracohumeral ligament. In order to identify the coracohumeral ligaments, usually I'll put my uh, probe sitting down at the coracoid. That's a little bit easier to identify. And I'll use the distal aspect or the lateral aspect of the probe, go a little bit cephalot until I get to the acromion, and you'll be able to see this coracoacromial structure, which is often implicated in long head of the biceps instability. So moving on, even though we know the problem is more anterior, it's very important to get a full thorough evaluation of the lateral as well as the posterior shoulders. So my lateral view usually um, is identifying the supraspinatus tendon. Usually I do that in a cra um, crass or modified crass um, uh, position, making sure we identify the greater uh, tuberosity over here, seeing the full aspect of the supraspinatus tendon that's present, as well as rotating the probe 90 degrees to make sure we see the uh, short axis of the supraspinatus uh, that is present as well. I move on to the posterior where you kind of identify your probe this way, seeing the deltoid infraspinatus as well as the teres minor that are present. Usually I'll scan all the way to the lateral aspects where you could kind of go uh, 90 degrees to kind of see the infraspinatus tendon as it attaches um, at this location right here. You kind of do the same thing, even though it's a little bit more difficult, you go inferiorly to the inferior spine to kind of identify the teres minor and be able to kind of see that as its insertion. Uh, that's usually my protocol for the posterior aspect. Second to the last, we get a glenohumeral joint just to make sure you check for effusion. This is the humeral head. This is the glenoid over here. You have a little bit of the labrum that's present. Usually when we do this, you do a little bit of internal and external rotation, checking for effusion, making sure you don't have any swelling that's present over here. Because a lot of times, if you have this effusion, that will actually uh, uh, go all the way to the anterior aspect of the shoulder. So if you have some effusion over here, then you want to check to see if this, if the anterior biceps tendon fluid, if there's some effusion posteriorly that could kind of flow around to the anterior aspect of the shoulder also. Lastly, but not the least, I look at the uh, suprascapular nerve, looking at the 
suprascapular notch, as well as the spinal glenoid notch. So identify suprascapular uh, notch, usually I'll get the AC joint and I use my medial aspect of the probe to go a little bit inferior. And that's kind of where you'll see the suprascapular nerve that's sitting right around this area. A lot of times when I do suprascapular nerve injections, very important to put on your Doppler to kind of make sure you're not injecting the blood vessel. And I tend to do this on the medial to lateral approach to make sure you kind of anesthetize the nerve and not a blood vessel in issues such as glenohumeral arthrosis or even sometimes adhesive capsulitis. So, so far we've discussed some of the uh, um, pathophysiology of the long end of the biceps instability. We've highlighted some of the E3 physical examination and we've also discussed what an average scanning protocol will look like in the office. So let's talk a little bit about some of the ultrasound findings that you could see uh, in a patient. The first picture you see over here is more of a tenosynovitis where you just have this abnormal hypochoic type structure with a little bit thickening of the tendon. The key thing is to keep in mind that you don't see any discontinuity, you don't see any hypochoic or black discoloration that's present around this uh, groove right here. That's a little bit different from a partial tear where you start seeing a little bit more of a hypochoic finding. And when you get a look at long axis view of that, you see a little bit of discontinuity that's present which is more consistent with partial tear of the biceps tendon. When you get a full thickness tear or full tear, uh, making sure when you go proximally, you kind of tilt your probe a little bit cephalot to make sure anisotropy is not in action. You see this void that's present around the bicipital groove. Um, and that was more indicative of a full, rotator, uh, full uh, biceps tendon rupture. When you look at a long axis view, you see this discontinuity that's present, which is um, identified with this hyperchoic uh, look that we have over here. From an instability and subluxation standpoint, we discussed a little bit of the pathophysiology and mechanism of injury. So this is the lesser tuberosity, and this is the greater tuberosity over here. A lot of times you have suprascapular uh, tendon issue, in addition to the coracoemeral and the superior glenohumeral ligament. And as a result of that, you have the biceps tendon that tends to have this tendency of going medially in, as opposed to the groove that it's supposed to sit down over here. Um, the first uh, video that I showed earlier showed the frank dislocation, but this is just more of a subluxation that you could have. So how effective and how useful uh, ultrasound um, evaluation in some of this different biceps tendon uh, pathologies that we discussed. This was a very good study uh, by Ostrowski et al. And what they did is well, they gathered a lot of the different studies that's been done on long head of the biceps. And they took four of them that had level two uh, uh, proof of um, in terms of the study design and how it was uh, uh, done. And what it showed in general is this. There's close to 100% sensitivity and specificity for subluxation and dislocation. That is the same for full tear. But when we start talking about a partial tear, that's when the sensitivity and sens specificity is not as good. So I'm going to highlight a couple of the studies that they mentioned in this uh, study. So like I mentioned earlier, as it pertains to subluxation and dislocation, we're doing very good. As it pertains to the complete tears, we're doing fantastic. As it pertains to this partial tear per the study, zero out of 23. I have a little bit of problem with this particular study. This study was done about two decades ago uh, and the data was collected from 98 to 2001. And this um, study was released in 2006. Um, I suspect um, the ultrasound technology and the you know, technology behind that a lot better now compared to some of the ultrasound that was done 20 years ago. The other thing is the surgeon was actually not blinded to the ultrasound results that was done in this particular study. So there's some good things I take out of this study is they're really good for subluxation dislocation, they're good for full tears, but as it pertains to the partial tear, I think this numbers, in my opinion, could be a little bit skewed. 
So this is a couple of the other studies that were done. Um, Wang et al. kind of dealt more with tendinopathy. Uh, Breed and Perker did a better study and they suggested that in terms of tendinopathy and partial tear, ultrasounds are very good in ruling it in, but it doesn't necessarily rule it out. And that was the same um, conclusion with the last study by Skenzel and all. So I just want to kind of draw a little bit closer attention to this particular study, because this particular study gave some ideas in terms of how we could increase our sensitivity and specificity with lung head of the biceps tendinopathy. What they did was use this technology of sonographic grip pixels. The notion is if your biceps tendon is inflamed, there's increased water content that's present. And as a result of that, when you scan with an ultrasound, um, you could see a little bit more specific uh, findings on the ultrasound to let you know if there's tendinopathy or not. This particular study took about 300 or so patients that were already diagnosed with lung head of the biceps tendinopathy. And they used certain criteria. And when they used those criteria, the sensitivity and specificity was a lot better with this study compared to the previous one. So the criteria they used is this. If you have tendon shift fluid accumulation around that area, if you have increased color Doppler, as well as this measurements, uh, they're more likely to diagnose tendinopathy of the lung head of the biceps. Compared to the previous studies, they had a lot more poor sensitivity and specificity. So I think this is just something maybe we could take from a practical standpoint, use some of this, and see if we could do a better job of identifying tendinopathy uh, since we know we do well with instability, but not as well with partial tear and tendinopathies in general. So to come towards the end, um, the particular study that I, uh, patient that I saw, he ended up having a little bit more of a tendinosis or tenosynovitis with a little bit of instability, uh, subluxation, but no frank uh, dislocation that was present. My typical study uh, will involve a lot of the things that I've listed over here, um, talking about the patient's uh, chief complaint, what type of machine you use, what kind of probe is used, the study, uh, and a few other things. Usually, even though I don't necessarily, um, I, I know what the pathology is, I tend to do a little bit general uh, examination of the shoulder to make sure we don't miss anything. Uh, to kind of summarize things a little bit, the findings on the patient was a long head of the biceps tendon with slight uh, subluxation, but no frank dislocation. There was a little bit of uh, edema and uh, increased Doppler flow, which is more consistent with sinusinovitis. Uh, and the, 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 the impression kind of mentioned that as well. But more importantly, uh, diagnosing there was no evidence of a full tear that was present. Um, this is just another patient that I saw a few days ago, and I uh, just want to kind of add this biceps tendon sheet going all the way inferior, and you can kind of see the continuity of that. This patient did have a little bit of a partial tear of the biceps tendon, and like some of these studies mentioned, I think it's actually easier to see partial tears on the longitudinal view versus the transverse view. So for the particular patient that I saw, um, he opted to go for a PRP injection for the proximal biceps tendon, just because he's had about three of them before and he did very well. So that's kind of what he, he asked for and I had no problem doing it. So this is the lung head of the biceps over here, kind of going a little bit superiorly around that area. Real quick, one thing that I want to mention is I mentioned earlier that the transverse ligament actually has been shown not to be a good stabilizer but they do have some very strong nerve endings with if you just inject the transmit instead of the tendon, I wonder if we could kind of get the same good results and not necessarily injecting PRP into the tendon or corticosteroid injection uh, in the, um, around the tendon. So to kind of summarize things, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, uh, long head of the biceps instability can be divided into three types. We have the instability, we have the inflammatory, and you have the traumatic one. This chart kind of explains a little bit more 
uh, the primary as well as the secondary, um, go back, a primary and secondary inflammatory or tendinopathy is reasonable to do short time anti-inflammatories as well as ultrasound injections uh, for this particular one. If it's a younger athletic person who is not okay with losing some strength, it makes sense to kind of refer for surgical evaluation. If the person with primary or secondary tendinopathy try all this physical therapy and they try some other modalities, they try the injection and they're not getting better, it's very reasonable to kind of refer them to a surgeon as well too. But the vast majority of people and athletes with this, in my opinion, that I see, they end up not getting surgery for this. So in conclusion, lung out of the biceps tendon is a common cause of anterior shoulder pain. Ultrasound examination is more accurate than physical examination. Ultrasound examination is very good in diagnosing instability and complete tears, but for partial tears and tendinopathy, the studies are getting better with this. Um, ultrasound is good in ruling in partial tears of the lung out of the biceps, but not as good in ruling it out. So those are some of my references and I will stop to take some questions. All right, thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, Alfie. That was a fantastic presentation, you know, really highlighting several things that I think are, are quite important um, for this, uh, for the shoulder. And, um, you know, in particular, um, Sorry, one second here. Uh, in particular, I think, you know, you highlighted a couple of really important things. So one uh, is that there's a lot of coexistent pathology between the long head biceps tendon and the rotator cuff. And so, you know, when you're thinking about ultrasounding a patient who has anterior shoulder pain, and clinically you're suspicious of a long head biceps, you know, tendon uh, base problem. It really is important to, you know, incorporate your complete shoulder examination into that because, um, you know, our, our physical examination is quite good for the shoulder, but it's not perfect. And so while you may think, yes, this is primarily a biceps tendon problem, there also is frequently coexistent uh, other pathology in the soft tissue around the shoulder. And so highlighting that kind of complete comprehensive shoulder examination is very important. And I personally follow a protocol very similar to you where I start in the anterior shoulder um, and then I move on to the, you know, anterior rotator cuff, uh, AC joint, move to the posterior shoulder, do the rotator cuff tendons back there, uh, nerves joint, and then move to the supraspinatus at the end. Um, and so I think it's really important to, to note that. One thing you highlighted as well that I think is something that confused me for the longest time was I just thought that the, the transverse humeral ligament would uh, tear and people would dislocate their biceps tendon. And that's just simply not the case. There's a wide variety of pathology uh, that contributes to different patterns of dislocation and instability. And so people who tear that coracohumeral ligament and, and have that complete kind of snapping medial on top of the subscapularis and then back into the groove and then on top, uh, that is kind of the pattern that we think about when, when people talk about uh, having that instability of the biceps tendon. But when people tear the subscapularis, you can have that dislocate kind of medially uh, towards the joint. You can have it dislocate into the subscapularis um, and it can sit kind of within that muscle belly. Uh, and so there's, there's just a wide variety of kind of quote unquote instability related pathology that can happen. And it's really important to kind of understand what you're uh, looking at what structures may be injured and then and then being able to describe that accurately based on the pattern of dislocation uh, and the structures that are injured. And you're exactly right. You know, a lot of the, you know, older kind, kind of um, baseline studies we have from ultrasound in, in the 90s and, and even early 2000s, the resolution on the machines are, are vastly different than what we have now. And that does call into kind of the importance of repeating some of those original studies that haven't been repeated with our current technology and highlighting kind of the things that we're able to see now versus maybe what we were able to see in, in kind of the infancy of MSK ultrasound. Um, so any, anyways, I think that was, that was fantastic. Um, if anyone else has any questions or comments, I'll open it up. Yeah, I have a couple of comments. Alfie, that was very not, <laughs> well done and 
and you know again highlighting the point of the relationship with uh, rotator cuff pathology just a little splitting of terms when i think of instability i think of something actually moving from one to the other let's say during the exam in my experience true bicep instability that first little video you showed is pretty rare i think the only person i've actually seen uh, a true biceps instability is a young female um, with hyperlaxity syndrome where it would flip over medially over to lesser tuberosity. But really what we're referring to here is a continuum of the biceps, you know, starting to drape over the medial wall or the lateral wall of the lesser tuberosity and, and potentially working its way to dislocate medially over the lesser tuberosity. I do want to highlight that, you know, most bicep pathology is a continuum and I call it a, it's an attritional process and it's a attritional process that involves the whole complex of the subscapularis, um, the supraspinatus oftentimes, and then the rotator interval. And, and again, splitting hairs, but, you know, recent studies have shown there's really not actually a true transverse humeral ligament you know, a ligament attaching from the lesser to the greater tuberosity. These are fibers of the subscapularis blending in with the pectoralis major. And so there's not, a, again, a specific ligament attachment from the lesser to the greater tuberosity. So this highlights the point of the, you know, the relationship of the pathology between particularly the subscapularis and the long head of the biceps tendon. So this, what I call attritional continuum, you know, starts with oftentimes an anterior leading edge uh, supraspinatus tear, um, and then uh, the cephalad fibers, undersurface fibers of the subscapularis, um, often undergoing attritional change. And then the earliest changes I see in the long head of the bicep is just some irregularity of on short axis of the biceps itself, and that may not only include irregularity in the groove, but also you know in the interval as you've pointed out. As, as, a, as it goes on, we see the bicep kind of flatten and splay along the lateral edge of the lesser tuberosity and then potentially dislocate medially. Um, and it, it could dislocate medially or it could rupture. Um, and it usually ruptures at the entrance to um, the rotator interval. And I do want to make a comment. Ruptures can be hard and they can be hard because it tendon sheath can be thickened. And if the tendon sheath is thickened, uh, it can look like the long head, the biceps tendon. So uh, an important trick that I do is anytime I see significant biceps pathology, I scan in short axis transverse down to the biceps muscle and then work my way up. And this allows me two uh, advantages. The first advantage is then I can see some retracted muscle fibers and I know there's a rupture. Secondly, you can miss immediately dislocated biceps. And so by starting distal and working your way proximal, you'll see the fibers of the biceps in, in the bicipital groove very distally right above the pectoralis major, but then you'll see them uh, turn medially. So anytime I see biceps pathology, I always translate my probe distally to the muscle, work my way proximally, and that way, I'm not missing a rupture or immediately dislocated biceps um, that again, can be hard. I agree with Brandon, these studies do need to be repeated because the sensitivity of ultrasound, I think is, is much better than an MRI for um, biceps pathology. So again, uh, nice presentation, Alfie. Thank you. Brandon, have you seen any true biceps instability, you know, where it just dislocates back and forth with internal external rotation? Yeah, like you, I think I've had one um, and it was a while ago. I can't recall the exact clinical uh, situation of that patient, but most of the time I see it just like you sitting just on top of the lesser tuberosity and, and I would say relatively rarely kind of fully dislocated. It usually is just kind of in that perched position, kind of sitting within the subscapularis fibers and, and like you were saying, um, with the um, with the transverse uh, humeral ligament, it, the subscapularis actually has fibers that go both deep to and superficial to the biceps. So they kind of split around the biceps. It doesn't just attach deep or superficial. It, it, they actually seem to go 
both ways based on the last studies I've seen. Um, and so I think that's why you kind of see it where it's kind of sitting inside of that subscapularis sometimes or it appears to be. Exactly. And, and you know, the surgeons will say if, if they're being very careful at arthroscopy, it's pretty rare with this rotator cuff, again, a, this attritional rotator cuff disease to see the deep or articular side fibers of the of the cephalad portion of the subscapularis to be normal. There are almost always, you know, partial thickness tearing in those cases. Yeah, and, and Doug, that's another point, you know, that I always, if I see anything abnormal from where the biceps tendon is located, I spend a lot of time looking at those superior subscapularis fibers to make sure I'm not missing a, a, a tear there because they're almost always associated with each other. Um, and then, the last point I'll make is, you know, there is actually a pretty high um, incidence of people having this aponeurotic expansion from the uh, supraspinatus uh, uh, down that runs kind of superficial to the biceps tendon sheath. And that can sometimes, it's usually a pretty flat um, kind of little sheet of, of kind of, I don't know, aponeurotic fibers that aren't really all that obvious on ultrasound, but some people can have more of like a, a kind of cord-like aponeurotic expansion from the supraspinatus. And that could make you think that there's a biceps tendon or where it isn't, or that there's a, a split tear or something like that. And so just being aware that that's another um, structure that can be uh, in that area is, is important. Yeah, I think for me, while doing this presentation, I think the key points that you guys mentioned was what stood out to me about you know, maybe a potential study just injecting what we call the transverse humeral ligament, maybe one cc's, is that going to eliminate all the pain? Because it's just more of the pain generators. Understanding that that might not actually be a true structure, it's an extension of subscapularis. I think there's just a lot of things that comes to mind that maybe we need to redo and repeat and uh, see where we go from there. Certainly. All right, well, unless anyone else has additional comments, I'll end it there so people can uh, move on with their day. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Olafade. That was uh, fantastic once again. Thank you. All right, and then we'll be back uh, in a few weeks for our next presentation as we typically are.